you. Thank you very much. Um, everything you should know about web development in 2022. Well, I have to tell you people that this is a pretty hefty title and I will let you know how this came to be. Um, but a little disclaimer here, I would like to change that to things you should know about front-end development in 2022. So if you want to <laughs> jump tracks, now's the chance. But why, what happens here? Um, I started looking into this and well, front-end and web development got so complex and so huge, especially in the last two, three years and in the front-end space. So what happened and why I do have the honor to speak here right now is I've spoken at Defternity in 2019 and I gave a talk that was called Frontend Development 2019, What's in Your Stack? That was in person, right? Good old times. And basically this is the continued talk of this talk that I gave in 2019. And I want to give a disclaimer before we get started. So I'm more settled in the front end space. And over the last five, six years, well, front end exploded, right? I think there, there's this uh, article on CSS tricks, which is called The Great Divide. And I think it holds true until today that front end development is kind of divided into different camps these days. We have on the left side, we have React, Next, uh, Next, Apollo, GraphQL, Site Components, Webpacks, everything going JavaScript. So this is definitely one camp. And we have on the other side, uh, more like UX, CSS, um, more platform focused people. And this is why covering everything that is going on in web development or front end development is just not possible today. Nevertheless, I want to give you a, an overview of what I think is exciting, what you should know, and maybe equip you with some knowledge that is helpful when you want to build for the web. So I think there's this group um, that is trying to stay as close as possible to the browser technology and um, don't overdo it with JavaScript, for example. And then we have on the other side, this camp that does JavaScript for all, or uses JavaScript for all the things. But I also think there are two different buckets that we have to consider when we think of uh, technologies that we all use. And it depends on what we are building. There are for sure a lot of app developers out there, but building websites is still a thing, right? I honestly believe that not everything needs to be a massive, highly complex app. And when we look at these four buckets, and you will find that on the topic selection, selection that will just follow in the next 45 minutes, is that I'm leaning towards building websites. And uh, I don't mind if you, of using um, platform features, browser, new fancy hipster uh, browser stuff, or going all in on JavaScript solutions, but I'm leaning a little bit more towards building websites. So, she, so keep that in mind um, when considering what I will tell you. So let me quickly introduce myself. I'm Stefan. I'm tuning in from Berlin, Germany. You find me on the internet pretty much everywhere with my name. I didn't come up with something fancy. So it's uh, Stefan Julius, and I work for a company that is called Checkly. So when you want to build good stuff for the web and you're building APIs or front ends or apps and you're looking for a solution to monitor your APIs, but also monitor your applications like signup flows, add to cart, whatever you're building uh, using, for example, Playwright, um, you can have a look at Checkly because honestly, I think it's pretty cool and it helps uh, shipping good stuff. I run a weekly newsletter. So if you like this talk, you might want to check this one out. And let's jump back and jump into the time machine. And let's have a look at what I talked about three years ago. So three years ago, I talked about TypeScript, GraphQL, Grid, WebP, Front Display, Focus Within, ECMAScript Modules, Lazy Loading, PWAs, Jamstack, Zero Conflict, JavaScript, Cypress, Serverless, and Web Components. So this is three years ago. What happened? But before we look at this, let me just stress that not enough. It's fine to disagree with my opinion here uh, and back then three years ago. And it's also fine um, to tell me, hey, chef, and you missed this important thing that is happening in the ecosystem. Um, there's so much things going on that I only have 45 minutes. So when we look at this selection of three years ago, what happened here? So I do honestly think that CSS Grid is there. If you haven't had a look at it yet and you're not using it, you're missing out, my friend. Uh, WebP is pretty much there as a new and fancy image format. Font display for proper font handling is there. Focus within happened as a CS CSS uh, pseudo class and lazy loading for images arrived natively in the platform, which is pretty, pretty cool. There were also some things that evolved over time though. So TypeScript evolved, not the language itself, but I think we are entering a new stage of TypeScript now. Um, I will cover that a little bit later. Then we had this Jamstack thing happening, whatever that means. I will share why I think, why I don't like the term too much these, anymore, these days anymore. And yeah, serverless happened, right? So that is huge. 
And then we have things that sort of played out from these things that I covered three years ago. So I do think that GraphQL became sort of like a standard, but it didn't get as big as I predicted it to be. That is cool. Um, I think progressive web apps, PWAs are sort of there, but the adoption and the communities, well, it's kind of there, but I it didn't take off as much as I thought it would. Zero config JavaScript kind of went into framework levels, which I think is a little bit surprising. And we have the never ending topic of web components. Well, maybe in three years, uh, from now, when I might be allowed to speak again at Dev30, maybe we can cover them because web components are still a niche thing, in my opinion. So let's have a look at the state of the web platform. And this most likely, or this most of all includes browsers and what is happening. CSS Grid arrived. I just want to repeat that because if you're not uh, using CSS Grid today, um, if your browser support um, allows it, which it most likely does, um, you should have a look. Um, CSS Grid is a beast, but it makes things also way, way easier in terms of structuring layouts and um, kind of grouping things and doing hard th things that used to be hard and in an easy way. And it can also get super, super wild, like what you see there. This is grid template columns definition with grid areas and a lot of logic in there. So CSS Grid is hands on one of the best things that happens to CSS layout layout in the last three years. Um, we also covered, or I covered WebP back in the day, but there was an image format coming out of nowhere, which was which is AVIF, A-V-I-F. And this is also going close to browser support these days. So what you see here is an image with the dimensions of 2000 by 1333 pixels, uh, which it was downloaded from Unsplash. And originally it had 333 kilobytes. If you optimize that with Squoosh, which is an app for image optimizations by the Google folks, you can cut it down to 115K. Then there's also WebP, which is now cross-browser supported. So you can um, uh, shrink it down to 70K. But then we have this new kind of fancy format, which is AVIF, and you can shrink it even further there. And you see there that we're going down to 10% of the original uh, image rate. So if you want to kind of save some bytes on the wire, which you should, um, you should have a look at AVIF and kind of feature detect if the browser of choice supports it. Which browsers are we talking about? So we have AVIF, um, according to kind of use, it works in Chromiums, which means Chrome and Edge, works in Firefox. Safari is, <laughs> is doing a little dance because it's it's paired to operating systems and it has partial support. So that's a little bit tricky. But if you do feature image support detection, you can save a little bit of bytes on the wire. And I was like, I always like it to load less stuff. Then in terms of my research, what happened is that I just discovered 55 things of what you might ask. So let's have a look at the 55 defined um, pseudo classes that we have in CSS today. So we have full screen model, picture in picture, then we have a lot of form stuff like autofill, placeholder shown, indeterminate, blank, invalid, out of range, required, optional, user invalid. We have direction and language for um, localization with any link, local link, target within. We have some video stuff for playing, past, current, past, and future. We have fancy selection stuff like nth child, only child, last of type, only of type, hover active, focus visible, focus within. Um, it, there is a lot these days, and CSS became incredibly powerful over the last few years. And I want to focus on these three because I consider them still fairly new. So I want to talk about is, where, and has today. So what is, is, and where? So let's consider a selector such as this one. We're selecting every HL, H1 element that is either in a section, article, a site, or nav. And you see that this kind of selector, writing these kind of selectors is not fun. It's a little repetitive, but that's not a great selector. You can unify this by using is. So you could now say, hey, is it if it is a section, article, a site, or nav, and it includes an H1, please select the H1 doing this one. You could do the same thing with where though. Um, so what is the difference here and when should you use which? Well, the difference of the two is in terms of specificity. Um, I won't go into uh, specificity too much here right now, but the overall rule is specificity defines what styles are applied to an element when multiple selectors are matching this uh, element. And you see here that is 
and where has different specificities because everything that is where um, that is inside of a where pseudoclass is basically done to zero, which means that you can use it for default styles and all these kind of things, so that things can stay easily um, overridable, and that is kind of nice to have. Then there is a huge, huge thing happening, which is called has. This was formerly known as the parent selector, but I think it should be, and I think we all, or most of the people discovered that it is actually a family selector. So what does that mean? Let me show you how you could use has. So what we have here is a simple form with a label and input and a submit button. And you see here some functionality that all these kind of things are changing state depending on the state of the input. This was usually not possible without JavaScript. What we can now do is we can say, hey, if there's any form that has something that is invalid or valid or placeholder shown, please change these kind of things. There are completely new patterns of CSS um, approaching right now, and we yet have to find out what will uh, what will this all make possible. So you could use has to, for example, check if a figure has a fig caption element, or if an A or a button includes a direct SVG element. Does an article has a H1 or an H2? What happened in, with the relationship between headlines and paragraphs? Is a form that has stuff in it focused? So you can now reach out and kind of style all the parents. And if you're writing CSS, this is incredibly, incredibly exciting. So let me show you an example. What we have here is uh, three divs and uh, one div that includes two other divs that are saying hello world. Um, as an example layer, we have that on the right side. So we could now style this like this. For example, we could say, hey, all divs should have a blue background and white color, which means we would have three blue boxes. What we could do too is we could say, hey, we only want to style the divs that are inside another div. So you see now that the two divs on the right are colored blue. We could now flip this around and we could say, hey, only style divs that include other divs. So this is now the parent selector case, right? So this is a basic use case of has. You could also go old school CSS or this works for ages. You could say, please only style divs that are um, next to a another div, right? So div plus div means, hey, if there are two divs next to it, uh, please um, style the second one. And you could now also flip this around. And you could say, hey, only style this div if it is followed by another div. So this is the inversion direction. And uh, apologies for the ambulance outside. So has really enables us, and CSS now reached the point that we really can select elements in all directions. We can go inside of elements, we can go outside of elements, we can go down elements, so elements next to each other and following each other, and we can go for elements that are preceding elements. And this is a huge shift in writing CSS, and we yet have to discover all the new patterns that has will uh, enable us to do. So what is the support right now? So CSS has is supported in Edge and Chrome. So Chromiums are there, Safari is there. Um, Firefox has it behind a feature flag, but the peer pressure is pretty high right now. So I would expect that has will land at, le at latest in six months, uh, cross-browser support. Um, so this is definitely something to, to have a look at right now. And if you want to learn what is possible using has, you can go to the Chrome developer blog. Um, Jay Tompkins wrote a nice article there or on the WebKit blog. Jen Simmons also covered a bunch of things with a lot of examples for you to check out and get started. But has is not the only thing that is super, super duper exciting. We also have this thing happening container queries. And this is basically something that developers and CSS developers are asking for for ages. I talked to a person last week and they told me that they would have cut, cut off their left arm to be able to do this because since we do responsive web design, we all um, kind of connect everything to viewport width and height. And this is usually not what we want to do. We usually want to base uh, style elements depending on how large these particular elements are. And this is now coming to the web platform and this is huge. So the way that it works is that you can have a div class container uh, and this includes a section here. And then you have to define a container type. This gives the browser the information what to watch out for, what size, so on what angle of size you want to check out. I uh, want to watch this container in this sense. So inline size means that we want to check or measure the container on the inline axis, which is this one. And then we have to give it a name. 
what we now can do is we could also make unify that in a single single line here. So we can define um, type and name over this one. And now it gets fancy. So we can give the section that is inside of this container a blue background. And now check this out. We can define a container query and measure the container width to style the elements inside of this container, depending on the container width. This now means that if we measure this container, the div with the class container outside, and it changes size, we are able to style the elements that are inside of this. This is huge. And if this really lands, so it's, it's not without a really, if this lands, this will change how we write um, responsive layouts for real. Container queries can also come with different and new units. So you might uh, be familiar with the viewport units. So 100 V height and 100 VW are pretty much the viewport, like 50 VH are 50% 50 of the viewport height. With container queries, there are also new units. So we have CQH and CQW to give you something like, hey, I want to style this 50% of the container with in this case. So you can use these units too. And I think that's super exciting. Uh, speaking of units, um, there is a, there are a few new units that are now cross-browser supported too. So there are large, small, and dynamic viewport units. So DVH, um, LVH, and SVH, um, which are important when you build mobile uh, or responsive web design, especially for mobile devices. These take um, browser UIs like a scroll bar or the keyboard into consideration. So if you're shipping to mobile, you might want to check these out. And if you want to learn more, Bramos, uh, from the Google team uh, wrote um, a nice article about this just recently. It's available under web.dev viewport units. But container queries will not stop at the size aspect of, uh, of this particular container. So there's also more things in the making. So container uh, queries, hopefully, most likely, will also be able to catch um, certain CSS properties. So you see here that there's a container query that checks if this container has the background color set and then flips some things around. This could be um, helpful, for example, um, design system components where you have something configurable and you might want to adjust everything depending on a certain uh, CSS property. And if we're that far, we can also make it custom property dependent, which then means that components become kind of configurable from the outside via custom properties. I still have to wrap around my, my head about what will be possible there, but I think, holy moly, this is what we needed and we are moving into the right direction. So in container queries, we're like, yeah, they're coming. Everybody was super excited over time um, over the last year. And when will it actually ha be happening? And let me tell you, we're not that far off. Chromium's uh, Edge and Chrome are shipping them. Safari are shipping them. Firefox will start shipping in January 2023. So container queries are around the corner. And um, most likely, your browser support will uh, allow you to use them. So you might want to check them out and get your hands onto them right now. Now, so these two things allow us now to write truly component-driven CSS. Container queries will enable us or enable us to style elements based on their size, whereas has let us style elements based on their content. This is, and let me just stress this, this is huge. This will change how we write CSS going forward. Nevertheless, I do think that um, the web platform, including HTML, is not powerful enough yet, and we need more components. For the people that do UI work or front end work, you probably have built a ton of date pickers or custom selects with JavaScript um, in the past. I think um, there, there should be more components to make the web as powerful as it should be. And there's actually work happening. So what you see here is the openui.org, which is basically a new um, initiative to kind of collect and check all the design systems that are out there. Um, looking at all the companies, all the developers that are reinventing the wheel all the time and then questioning if there should be particular components inside of the web platform um, itself. And what they're looking at are alerts, badges, breadcrumbs, dialogues, files, skeletons, sliders, select, tabs, I'm pretty sure I, I've built a lot of these uh, with a custom implementation many, many, many times. And it's very exciting to see that a lot of things might go into the platform not too far off. These are the things that are a little bit advanced in spec writing because writing specs is hard, right? So all these kind of things take a little bit of time. 
Um, but you see here an example of select menu and pop-up. So what you see there on the left is an example that works without any JavaScript. You see there that there's a custom select. There's, there is this little pop-up going up um, that you can style it, that you can do this. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do this just with declarative HTML without reinventing the wheel? Well, this is happening. Uh, I cannot predict when this will come, but... I think we are on the right path here, and this is very exciting. So this example was done with a new select menu HTML element and using the pop-up attribute. Um, so there are no immediate action items here, but you can um, watch out for this. This will hopefully come. And select menu by itself is super exciting. I mean, look at this. Wouldn't it be cool if we could just write these kind of UI elements without kind of reinventing the wheel and kind of having just a little bit or even no JavaScript to be able to customize how form controls or tabs or something like that works. I think this would just give us as UI developers a lot of superpowers and make um, our stuff, um, makes us shipping our stuff way quicker, but also makes it more accessible because these kind of things will be um, spec out and hopefully will work across all devices and things that consume stuff on the web. Also, the new Dialog API shipped. So if you're doing uh, models or pop-ups, you can use Dialog today. So for what you see there is that I have a Dialog element in the page. And this Dialog element supports stuff like show model, close. It works with as hitting the escape key and all these kind of good things that you usually expect when you um, want to pop up a model. This went into the platform not too long ago. If you want to learn how to use this particular element, you can go to web.dev building a dialogue component. It is cross-browser supported these days. Um, so we're on the right track here. New, more, more stuff is shipping very, very quickly. Browser vendors are on fire lately. Looking a little bit further into the future, there is one thing that I'm particularly excited about, which is view transitions. This is a technology that is led mainly by the Google uh, and Chrome folks. It was uh, formerly known as shared element transitions. And the idea here is to give developers an easy way to transition elements or pages from one state to the other. And the code that you see here is um, from an early prototype. The main idea is um, that we will hopefully, hopefully, hopefully get as developers ways to define a beginning state of elements. Then the browser will sort of take a screenshot. Then we can define an end state, update the DOM. We say, here's the end screenshot, and then transition things from A to B with a little bit of CSS magic. And this then could lead to UIs that look like this. So you see a single page application that is built by Jake 8 Archibald. There are some custom transitions happening. Um, things are moving around, fading in, fading out. Um, but you see there that there are also transitions where things are morphing into each other, where things are become bigger and smaller. These are the interfaces that I would love to see on the web, but it's just too hard to build them right now. So this is now um, a nice example of where we are hopefully heading. And this is a single page application. But the beautiful thing is that this is also considered for multi-page applications. So things that are not routing via JavaScript. And you see here that there are transitions happening from one side to the other. But when you open up the dev tools, you will see that every navigation is an old school link click opening up and requesting some HTML. I mean, wouldn't it be beautiful if this would be possible with just a little bit of code? And you see here that there's not much JavaScript involved and it's all done somehow via CSS. So we tried or the people writing specs and working on browsers tried to get this into the platform a few times already. This time it looks very, very promising. Um, I hope that we will make it this time because I think the web should be a little bit more fancy and more things should, should provide a beautiful experience without kind of shipping a, an application framework and doing all the heavy, heavy lifting of transforming elements and doing all these kind of things. So this is very exciting. If you want to follow along, here's the GitHub spec proposal. It's github.com WICG view transitions. It's early stages, um, but I think this will also be a big one if the spec reaches maturity and other browser vendors will pick it up. Fingers crossed. Overall, I can really only tell you that if you're not following along what browsers are shipping these days, it is huge and things are moving incredibly fast. So Jen Simmons from Ella, um, from Apple just recently tweeted something like that. So subgrid has container queries, aspect ratio, viewport Unix, IC unit, X and color, focus visible, motion powers. There's a lot of stuff happening in parallel and browsers are catching up incredibly quickly here right now. 
So this is the platform part. I'm super excited about this, but I want to also pick up the TypeScript topic, right? I really think it's now time that TypeScript goes mainstream. Um, I was a little bit skeptical, uh, maybe still till six months ago, a year ago, but I think it is happening. And we see that in, for example, the state of JavaScript survey from last year, it's also open this exactly this or exactly right now. And static typings, um, are by far the most requested features by JavaScript developers. Um, I always consider them as nice to have, but I do see that they're incredibly helpful when you're building complex applications. Additionally, according to GitHub, TypeScript is the most uh, growing or the third most growing language on github.com. Um, so people are really jumping and adopting TypeScript. And I think it is really happening and it will be maybe at some point the language that JavaScript should have been. So if you're still on the train, like I was like a year ago and thinking, do I really need this? Mm. I totally, I totally understand you because, well, bringing in another tool, compiling some code, it can be a little bit cumbersome. Uh, I usually was on this train. I defined some typings if I needed them in JS doc, uh, my VS code editor picks them on, up automatically. This is cool. But if you look at this code, this is very verbose. Um, uh, I, I kind of hated doing this. And when we look at the job and the TypeScript counterpart, this is just a nicer developer experience. And I had a few very, very nice experiences with TypeScript over the time. So just a month ago, I picked up a new library. Um, I wanted to implement it. I didn't even touch the docs because the typings were so solid. The documentation was in types. It was an incredible experience. And then for the first time, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm sold. Let's all just do, do TypeScript. Uh, of course, there's type shipping, which means there might be fewer bugs, and the productivity gain for for complex JavaScript application is just huge. So I think this this is happening. I think this should happening so much so that people are looking into adding types to the uh, JavaScript language itself. So you see here the type annotations proposal, and the idea here is that browsers on ECMAScript by itself would allow type annotations in JavaScript itself, um, but browsers, when they are running your JavaScript, they would just skip over these like uh, like comments. And I think my prediction here is that this will happen. This will take a year or two until we reach there, but TypeScript is the language we need for complex stuff, and this is going to happen. So here's my humble prediction in that area. But also what happened over the last year or two is that TypeScript kind of reached the next level. So what you see here is my VS Code editor, and there are two files open here. So we have a, a server JavaScript file that spins up an endpoint, and we have a, on the right side a client JavaScript file that consumes this API endpoint. Over the last year or two, type safety end-to-end -end kind of um, made it, its appearance. And this is beautiful if you're building uh, full stack applications where you're maintaining your API and your client in the same way. So you see there that I'm messing now with the response and the signatures of this API route. And you see here that my client starts complaining, hey, this is not the data that I'm expecting here and it will not be available. This is beautiful if you're building full stack applications. And if you haven't checked it out, um, I can highly recommend it. This example works with TRPC. Um, so if you want to check out how you can reach type safety uh, end to end with a library, you can have a look at this one. So coming from TypeScript, I would like to move the topic a little bit to the state of the web. And as I mentioned, I'm a little bit more leaning towards um, building websites. And man, we're we're growing. We're we're pushing more code. Uh, things become complex, and I want to question a little bit if all this complexity is needed. Uh, in October 2022, um, the median page weight for a website, according to HTTP Archive, they're crawling the web and kind of do web statistics. We passed two megabytes. Uh, on median for a normal website. I really want to question if all this code is needed for these kind of things. And also JavaScript um, on a mobile device, we are coming close to half a Mac compressed code. And I really doubt that we need all this code for do all the things we do on the web. And we reached a point that kind of React really is mainstream here right now. Keep in mind, this is my bubble, bubble, but I think we reached a point where everybody uses React because everybody uses React because everybody uses React. We just reached the point that it is the default choice for most of the things. And I know there are other frameworks, but React for sure in my bubble is the loudest one. 
But I want to question, what are we using all this code and JavaScript libraries for, right? Um, I don't know what you're working on. Um, if it's a redo platform, a blog, shop, maybe some apps, marketing site, games, productivity apps, PWA, streaming sites, social networks. There are a lot of different use cases and you could do anything on the web, right? But shouldn't we kind of take the consideration and have a thought about what we're actually building? For example, this is just my humble blog. I would 100% say that this is just a website, right? But if we look at products, for example, like you see here, Code Sandbox, which is a full-fledged in-browser editor experience, right? This is clearly a web app. Ship, uh, they can ship me as much code as I want because I'm opting into using their product in that case. What about Amazon? Yeah, I don't know. Is that a website? Is that a web app? What should, what should we do with Amazon? I think it's a little bit tricky. And in this kind of differentiation, there's a huge gray zone, but I think we should talk more about um, what uh, what hammer fits which nail. Here's a fun fact that I always like to plug. If you have the, the feeling that you're falling behind, there's still jQuery and Amazon's uh, front-end code base. So don't worry about that. This is just how it is. So we went from multi-page apps, so every navigation is a new HTML request, to single-page apps uh, quite a while ago. And the might, a big differentiation here was that in the world when we started kind of doing, or when I started doing web stuff, all the work was done on the client, on the server, right? And then we crunched it all together to HTML and we requested a lot of stuff um, to enrich this initial experience. And then it all was pretty much done, right? Um, for subsequent requests, then we did the same work on the server side again, and then all the other code was already sitting in cache, which led to fast experience going forward. Then we started to move everything to the clients, right? And we started doing um, single page apps. And now we had something like this, where one component lo loads another component, where, which loads another component. At some point, there's some data fetching happening and we see a lot of spinners everywhere. And this entire model kind of is a little bit broken because we are now moving with this approach, all the work to the client. And we don't know about network, CPU, memory, all these kind of things are big unknowns. And we're shifting all this work into this environment that we don't control. I want to question this approach in most of the cases. So in the Remax docs, which is one of these new fancy hip frameworks, is uh, they said that you can make your requests, uh, your server fast, but you can't control your user's network. And I think this is super, super valid and good advice over here. So to work around this, what happened is that we entered this area, right? The Jamstack area, era, which includes JavaScript, APIs, and markup. Then it was renamed to Jamstack. And now... I would like to drop this term like entirely um, to modern web development because there are so many things going on. I think it's just um, Jamstack, in my opinion, lost a little bit in its, its meaning. So we started with server-side rendering where all the work was done on the server when the request came in. Then we moved everything to, to the client to do everything in JavaScript and do it on this side. This had the advantage of a nicer de developer experience. Then we figured that all these spinners and the experience was not so great and we went for static site uh, rendering, right? This is the jam stack then. And this, ha this has advantages. Um, you can roll back easily. Everything's fast. You can e put everything on a CDN layer. But now you're figuring out, well, I have to render 10,000 pages in the build and it maybe takes 10 minutes. That's also no not a great solution. Then we had incremental static regeneration, which is Vercel's approach to this problem. And we have distributed persistent rendering, which is Netlify's approach. The idea here is that you still run kind of on the model to pre-render all your stuff, but you're not pre-rendering all the pages, but only your most important pages. For the rest, whenever the requests come in for particular routes, and Netlify or Vercel or other hosts will then generate this page and we'll put it on the CDN layer so that subsequent requests are then coming from the CDN. So you can delay the rendering of the route. And after that, you get all the performance regains. Uh, Vercel with ISR, incremental static site regeneration, static regeneration also allows you to revalidate a certain route after a particular interval. This is pretty, pretty cool stuff. But what should you use? I mean, what, what is your hammer for, for the nail that you, that you want to do? <laughs> That's a, I'm falling, failing on this analogy. But what should you use? And the answer to this is like, hey, it always depends because every tech choice has trade-offs. And where are we today? Today, we have, for example, Next.js is pretty much leading the JavaScript ecosystem with new innovations. And a lot of new React features start to ship only in Next, which is 
maybe a little bit boring. Um, then we have the Angular ecosystem. I'm not part of this ecosystem, but I know that it's still healthy and it's still going on. Then we have the view ecosystem, which is um, the counterpart for fancy rendering me mechanism. There is Max.js. Then we have recently starting this framework appearing, which is called Remix. Um, they were recently acquired by Shopify. So, and they have approached to move browser standards to the server side so that we can make things a little bit leaner and a little bit easier. And you can have a look at these. But there's also a complete counter push happening to these kind of things. So we have Quick, Eleventry, Astro, and all these kind of part of, um, um, counter uh, frameworks kind of take a positioning depending on what you want to do, right? Think of the fact you want to build apps or websites. And Quick, Eleventry, and Astro are positioning themselves very, very strongly to build websites for the web. So 11 uh, kind of tagline is, hey, a simpler static site generator. And Astro is kind of this double da doubles down on HTML and shipping as little JavaScript as possible. And you see a quote um, that, well, a blog probably doesn't need a full-fledged application framework like Next.js. And you can kind of cut all the code that you need to ship just for, uh, for content. One thing that these frameworks start to adopt now is something that is called like island architectures. And the idea here is that you ship initial HTML and then you define so-called islands that are only dynamic parts that will need JavaScript um, when the user interacts with them. And this feels a little bit like full circle because this feels a little bit like jQuery widgets like 10 years ago. And we're, we're back there and the developer experience these days is way nicer though. If you haven't heard, if you have heard uh, now the term island architecture for the first time, you can check out patterns on dev or this island architecture blog on the right side. Links are there. Um, I think we will see more about this um, in the building website space. But there's one thing that I do think that all these kind of frameworks, doesn't matter if they're for apps or websites, have in common. And that is that we will start living on the edge. Right. Initially, um, this is when I started. I my first websites and products were on an origin server server in Germany, and I had all my assets on a CDN layer. Then I entered the Jamstack movement, right, and I put everything on CDN, uh, pretty much. But now we reached a point with serverless function and edge compute that our servers and our logic can run anywhere in the world. And my friends, the game is on. There is a huge competition right now between all the modern hosting providers to um, offer the best user experience to push out edge functions as quickly as possible and get this new approach to running your code all around the planet. And in preparation of this talk, I talk, hey, I uh, asked Twitter, uh, what are the trends that you're seeing? My, my friend Pavel kind of summed it up very, very nicely. So you said edge everywhere. The battle is between the vendors to provide the best develop, develop experience to deploy the code. Netlify, Cloudflare, Universal, et cetera. And I think this is on point. And I think this is also what we're seeing right now with all the hosting providers that we have out there. So we have Vercel, um, which is developing Next.js, um, but it's also supporting um, the development of the Svelte framework. On the other side, we see Netlify, who is sponsoring the development of 11T and also um, um, helps out Solid.js for development. I think we now reach the point where we have as a developer community and maybe yeah, as a developer community, we have to learn what edge means. Does it mean that we run entire application code on the edge? Does it mean that we only use the edge for redirects or cookie handling or tiny pieces? Uh, we have to learn what is scalable. We have to see where we end up with this, uh, where the use cases are, what makes sense. And frameworks will lead the way here. And this is why, is why you see a lot of um, hosting providers kind of starting sponsoring and putting a lot of money on different books because, well, they want to, um, that we all use their edge stuff. Other than that, I think there is also a lot of advances happening in the tooling space. Um, I was very, very skeptical about all these new tools that were written in different languages like Go or Rust. And I, my JavaScript processes or my JavaScript crunching and compilation took maybe a second. I thought that that was fine until the point I used ESBuild for the first time. You see a benchmark of um, ESBuild. It's a JavaScript bundler. You see it there compa comparing Parcel, Rollup, and Webpack. Um, this is a benchmark on a project, right? You, had, uh, you have to trust and check um, if uh, any benchmark is actually viable. Um, but when I used ESBuild for the first time, I was, I was blown away how much faster it is. 
Um, so this is a huge recommendation if you're not using one of these tools that written in a different language. The difference of speed is so substantial that I'm leaning in. I'm saying, okay, I'm all in this now. There are more projects in, uh, in the ecosystem. So there's also SWC. This is also coming from the Vercel crowd. And there's a new tool coming up. Um, so um, check this with caution. So roam.tools will be a linter, a tester, a pretty fire, a bundler. Um, this is going to be uh, released uh, mid of this year. And both of them are written in Rust. So I think the speed difference um, of these new tools written in a different language is worth it. Took me a while to lean in, but I think it's 100% worth it. But then there's also um, that testing in our field, especially in the UI and front-end field, has evolved like a lot. In 2019, I had this slide in my deck, uh, which says that I love writing end-to-end -end tests, and no one ever said this. Um, and I was predicting that Cypress is going to be big. And I think that's true. Cypress um, became big. It's a wonderful product. I think it has beautiful experience. But competition is always good. And I think there's a new player in the field, which is Playwright. Uh, so Playwright is baked by Microsoft and it has some, some pieces to it that make it just a perfect tool for end-to-end -end testing, right? Testing, controlling browser sessions to really cover your functionality from front-end to server to database to hosting to really test and monitor your user experience. So what are the key facts here? So Playwright allows you to control Chromium, uh, so Chrome Edge, Safari Firefox works across operating systems and you can write your tests in JavaScript, TypeScript, .NET, Python, and Java. It comes with a very handy VS Code ex uh, extension. So you can debug your headless browser tests um, or your browser tests in general right from VS Code if that is your editor of choice. So that is pretty cool. And it took me a while to realize that Playwright is more than just a browser or, uh, browser control um, tool. So Playwright over the year um, if, um, became this full-fledged test runner with test blocks before each, after each. All this functionality that you usually expect from a test runner is baked into Playwright test today. It is easy to parallelize. So that is also something because you want to have two things when you're writing a test. They shouldn't be flaky and they should run fast, right? Because otherwise you stop maintaining them and they become kind of useless over time. So you can parallelize Playwright test because which is very, very nice. And it is built to make run script as quickly as possible. So UI testing usually means that you do something and then you wait for something and then you do something else. This usually meant that you place uh, wait for statements all over the place. Playwright supports mechanism for auto waiting and web first assertions, which means that usually you can drop a lot of uh, wait for statements and Playwright will figure out the rest for you, which makes um, your script um, look like they are sequential, but there's a lot of magic happening. It's honestly, it's pretty, pretty cool. And then I think there will be a push from Playwright testing at one moment in time because Playwright enables that to kind of Playwright monitoring. Disclaimer, um, I work at Checkly, we do this, but I think we should move as an industry and as front-end developers to make sure that all our stuff, all the user flows that we have work at all times. So that we can end up with not only API dashboards that say, hey, my APIs are up for 99.9999%. I think we should move away from this thinking and we should go over to, hey, my login flow works 99.999%. Because front end can be very complex today. And it should be, uh, there will be third parties, there will be hosts involved, the database involved. I think we should move things up a level to make sure that we um, ship uh, good stuff and we can be really sure that our stuff is working when it is running in production. I have one last point to make. Um, I think there's so much evolution happening. So browsers are pushing forward for new technologies. There is JavaScript is evolving. I think we are kind of advancing in the technologies that we use all over the place. And there's this one talk from Laurie Foss from Netlify and he kind of predicts what happens to web development. And it is an interesting talk. You might not like it. Uh, he also says when he starts the talk is that you might not look, he's a data analyst and he says, hey, look, this is how data progresses from A to B. And, and the thing is that we're moving always one uh, stack higher in terms of abstraction or in terms of things. When you, uh, or in terms of functionality that we do manually, right? If you consider kind of hosting a website, I'm not going to a data center and putting a computer in a rack and kind of configure all that stuff. This is all done for me. That was a different case 10 years ago. Nevertheless, he makes the point that we are on our path to moving to the next layer. 
And we see that sort of happening a little bit, um, So, which I think is interesting. So what you see here is the next image component, which is included in the Next.js framework by itself. And it does a lot of heavy lifting of image resizing for you, of lazy loading, all these kind of things that are possible on the web, but that a lot of developers myself include and myself included struggle with, right? Writing a responsive image declaration that covers all the components and all the viewpoints and does the right thing to not say, uh, waste any bytes on the wire. This is really hard. And there are all the frameworks or a few frameworks are pushing towards these higher level components, which is a little bit interesting. Maybe what happens to the fundamentals? Do we need to know how all this works? Is writing vanilla JavaScript at some point a, another specialty? And um, I think it's interesting. Oh, and I forgot to update something here. The same happened in Next.js with font handling. To avoid, um, for example, layout shifts when you're loading different fonts, the framework does that for you too. So are we on the way for more abstractions and writing vanilla CSS or vanilla JavaScript or vanilla browser APIs? Is that something that we will stop doing maybe in three years? I don't know, but I think it's very interesting um, to see what's, what's happening here. Next. And we will see. Maybe I will be next. Uh, will be back in three years, and I would love to see if this prediction um, held true. So, for the last forty-five minutes, I covered container queries, has view transitions, ABIF, select menu, playwright rendering, parts, pop-up, edge compute, end-to-end -end safety, Rust, uh, and Rust and Go tooling. And I think that is already a lot. Uh, in the talk description, there was written that I will also plug some things that help you to stay up to date. So if you want to stay up to date with what happens in browser land, forget all the newsletters, forget all the Twitters, forget anything that you maybe consume, go to GitHub and um, start following this repository. What you see is MDN browser compact data. This is pretty much the browser support information that is powering the MDN docs. And they are so kind to cut um, releases uh, with a lot of things that were updated in the MDN compat, uh, compatibility information. So if you want to follow along what new browser APIs were dropped, started shipping, uh, went cross browser support, this is worth your time. And I can only highly recommend looking at this. As I already mentioned, if you liked this topic selection over here, I, write a, uh, I run a weekly newsletter, um, which is webweekly.email. And if you want to go on to more newsletters, um, these are my few favorites. So JavaScript Weekly from Cooper Press, Web Development Reading List, um, ES Next News, Web Tools Weekly, and Bytes.dev. And lastly, um, if you're on the RSS train, which you should be, and to follow all your favorite bloggers, um, you can also find my entire RSS subscription on stefanjulis.com slash blog roll. So to drive this talk home, Three years ago, I closed this talk in a particular way, and I will do exactly the same here right now. So this tweet from Jenks Long from 2018 holds true until today. So he said that he never used TypeScript, he never used Parcel, he never used Elm, he never done Solverless, he never used Vue, and he doesn't feel behind. He chooses his stack and he's shipping with it. So whatever I just shared with you, if you heard of it already or not, um, use, your use your stack, do a little bit of research, and don't worry about feeling behind. Because you really, there's so much stuff, stuff happening uh, right now in parallel in the framework level, in the browser level, in the tooling level. There's so much stuff happening and you just can't consume it all and you can't always be cutting edge. Use what works for you, honestly. And I included a lot of links in these slides. So if you want to grab or catch the slide deck, you will find it at speaker deck Stefan Yudis uh, with this very, very long URL. I should have shown that, uh, but you find it on speaker deck. And this is all I have to say. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for listening. I'm Stefan from Berlin. If you have any questions, I'm all yours. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, so we have, we don't have too many questions this time. So just um, one of the questions is, are there any situations where Flexbox is still preferable over CSS Grid? Yeah, Flexbox and Grid have two different use cases. So Flexbox shines when you want, for example, to have um, flexible components that do certain behaviors when you shrink or go forward, right? Grid is like, hey, I want to have a three by three grid, this axis and these axis. Then you have to change how the columns and the rows happen. Flexbox has a functionality built in that allows you to 
expand children um, depending on flex grow and flex shrink. This is something that grid cannot do unless you change the configuration of grid. This is where Flexbox shines and you have to do a little bit of Flexbox magic, but this is where Flexbox, uh, where it's a Flexbox use case. So in general, grid, everything is settled in this little table, uh, Flexbox dynamic um, styling. All right. Um... You will have server side rendering. What kind of data that does the client receive? Could you elaborate how it works? Yeah, I can't, uh, that's hard to question. It kind of depends on how you architecture the thing, right? There are several approaches to this and depends on how much interactivity you want to have in the client. You could now write a full-fledged JavaScript application that needs to have some state, right? So there's a way to have a JSON block somewhere, which is then read and used to hydrate the application. There are also approaches to kind of have the state in HTML and fetch that. That is um, one of the framework that is doing that is quick. I had that in the slides. It kind of depends on your use case and how much interactivity you have. There is no straight answer to this question. All right. And the, uh, there have been a couple of requests about uh, uh, different links, a link for the YouTube that you mentioned. Uh, okay, speaker deck has already been found. Yeah, okay. <laughs> then, uh, yep, then uh, thank you very much. There are a couple of questions appearing uh, in Slack. So just, uh, yeah, if you could take a minute and answer it there. It would be great. For the rest, for sure. uh, thank you very much. We really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, have a nice day. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you, Stefan.